This list is up here for the uh, fee. Should we pass it around? Nobody wrote on it last week, but let's try it again. Thanksgiving feast, if you're going to. Is that a wedding picture? That is, yeah. I don't know who that scruffy guy is next to her, but she's sure pretty. <laughs> now, if there is a God in heaven, we should have time this morning for any questions or comments you have. Be gentle, but we should have time for them. In any consideration of the time span of creation's six days, one must begin, I think, we must begin with the sovereignty and omnipotence of God. For far too many interpret Genesis 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 3, based on current science, current theories, and the capabilities of today's nature, rather than on the nature of Almighty God. So it all boils down to that. Either we interpret God's Word based on the creation we know or the God we know. You have to choose. Or stated a different way, do we take God at His Word or do we, or do we force His Spirit-inspired text to conform to what today's science claims is possible? <coughs> do we confine God to humanity's constrictive box forcing him to play by our rules? Or do we accept and believe that he can do whatever he sets his mind to? So we begin with some of what God's Word says about who he is and his capabilities. Such as Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen, Ah, Lord Yahweh! Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. The Lord Jesus concurred in Matthew 19, verses 25 to 26. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Well, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The prophet Isaiah does a particularly splendid job of describing the unlimited power of God. Turn please to Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Isaiah 40. I want to look at several passages in this chapter. But let's begin. Let's begin with chapter 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? And then down to 15. Now, skip down to 21, verse 21. Do you not know? <coughs> Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who inhabits above the circle of the earth. 
and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to inhabit. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth utterly formless. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them, and they wither. And the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them by name. Because of the greatness of his vigor and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. That says it pretty well. Every reference in the Bible to God Almighty, El Shaddai, or just the Almighty, speaks of His unbounded omnipotence. God is absolutely capable to do anything. Period. So if one subscribes to that, taking the Bible as God's word on the matter, then one cannot at the same time chip away at his omnipotence by suggesting that, well, based on what we know about geology, carbon dating, the age of this earth, it would be impossible for it to be created in only six calendar days. No, either God is capable or he is not. We must decide. You must decide. Let's begin with what the text says in verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. That is, everything in verses 1 to 5 got accomplished in one day. The operative word here in the Hebrew is yom, Y-O-M, or literally Y-M, Translated, day. And the perennial question is, does yom here, and of course throughout the extended passage, mean a 24-hour day? Or an age? Or an eon? That is, an indeterminate period of time. Or, as a few commentators would have it, a day in God's eyes. That's a, that's a little escape clause, isn't it? Oh, it means a day in God's eyes, which is like a thousand years. Psalm 90, verse 4. Thus, by necessity, the length of time for creation is linked to the age of this earth, and there are several clues in the text itself to point us to a 24-hour day. First, verse 5 paints a picture of a literal earthly day with God called the light day, yom, and the darkness he called night, Leila. Sounds like Fiji Islands, doesn't it? Leila. Just as any human being would describe it, there was evening and there was morning one day. That's an earthly way to look at it. It's an way, earthly way to describe it. Second, as Leupold points out, there ought to be no need of refuting the idea that yom means period of time. That is, Reputable Hebrew dictionaries know nothing of this notion. It, yom is never translated an indeterminate period of time or an eon. Skinner agrees, quote, The interpretation of yom as aeon, a favorite resource of harmonists of science and revelation, is opposed to the plain sense of the passage and has no warrant in Hebrew usage. Finally, Kyle and Delish concur. Quote, if the days of creation, and I think this is the best way to say it for us, 
quote, if the days of creation are regulated by the recurring interchange of light and darkness, they must be regarded not as periods of time of incalculable duration, of years or thousands of years, but as simple earthly days. What's a day to us? A night and day. Finally, remember, the entire creation narrative from the end of 1 1 to 1 verse 31 is earth centric. He starts out, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he immediately zooms down to earth. And the rest is all about earth. Why then would the Spirit inject the yardstick of eternity to describe a day? Doesn't make sense. So if we conclude that the days of Genesis chapter 1 represent earthly 24-hour days, how do we then answer those who claim that science demands an older earth that required millions of years to be created and become what it is today? Well, let's consider just one example Probably the best example, at least in these parts, the Grand Canyon in the United States. Let me quote from the National Park Service website. Quote, With one of the clearest exposures of the rock record and a long, diverse geologic history, Grand Canyon is an ideal place to gain a sense of geologic or deep time. The oldest rocks exposed in the canyon are ancient. 1,840 million years old. Conversely, the canyon itself is geologically young, having been carved in the last 6 million years. Even younger deposits, including Ice Age fossils in caves, 1,000-year-old lava flows in the western canyon, and recently deposited debris flows, bring Ga Grand Canyon's geologic record to the present. That's from the National Park Service. No surprise there. It's probably safe to assume that most people who believe in a literal earthly week for creation also believe in a relatively far younger earth. That is, from the end of the first week to today then would be necessary to form the Grand Canyon according to the time span just presented by the National Park Service. If so, how do we resolve this apparent conflict? Now, the two, the first six days of creation, on one hand, and the age of this planet Earth, on the other hand, are admittedly two separate issues but we're beginning to see they are inevitably intertwined. If you believe this is short, you probably shorten up this over here. If you think this took millions of years, well, you probably consider the Earth took millions of years. This brings us to two terms commonly used to label these two camps, Old Earth and New Earth, two philosophies. In the parlance, meaning an earth millions or billions of years old and an earth only thousands of years old. And at that, probably fewer thousand than some people think. My proposal is that we adopt but redefine the term old earth to encompass both. Now stay with me on this. You can slap me upside the head later if you choose to. If we subscribe to the days of creation being literal earthly days of at least approximately 24 hours each, a normal day, then this means that it was all accomplished in what would be familiar to us as six days. Let's fast forward in this first week to the third day in verses 9 to 13. Chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. It was in this day that God separated the waters on the earth and thus revealed or created. It's, it's hard to say from the text. whether It's hard to know exactly whether God, it says revealed. It's translated revealed. And we kind of have a picture of the 
the earth rising up above the water. That could be, or God created it at that moment. It's, it's difficult to say. But in any case, that's when it was revealed. Dry land for the first time. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So this is the first time in the creation narrative that we have dry land. Note that each verse here ends either with the declaration, It was good, or the statement, And it was so. In other words, God repeatedly repeatedly says, Let something happen. But the narrative confirms that this was not simply a command that somewhere down the line these things would occur. That is, thousands of years later. He says, let something happen, but for them to occur immediately. Let something happen, and it was so. So when the dry land appears, the word is ra'ah in the Hebrew, made visible, For the first time, now we might imagine that this would be something like the raw stone of the earth's crust rising above the water. That kind of makes sense. The the crust of the earth, earth, the, the top layer shows itself for the first time. We might think some primordial stone slab, something like that. And God called... God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters He called seas. And God saw that it was good. In other words, it happened right then and it was good. Yet note what all happens immediately within the very same day. And it was so, is what it says. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. It happened right then. Same day. Yeah. Is there a general belief among theologians on the this pre-flood, how much land, how much more or less land there was than that which created it as opposed to after the flood? In other words, when God said, you know, hey, there's land, was there more of it then than after the flood? I've never read it an ex. Uh, well, it, well, let, let me. Uh, Maybe, maybe now's a good time to. Maybe now's a, a little bit. Uh, we will, we'll get to the flood in due time. Uh, but Mervyn loaned me this book, Carved in Stone: Geological Evidence of the Worldwide Flood. It weighs a ton. You could hold up. You could stop several doors with this, uh, and and it looks really good. I, I I would tell you, Mervyn, the two books you loaned me. I wish I had them a year ago. <laughs> then I would have read them. Uh, I will cite another resource that's in alignment with this, but this has a lot more pictures in it. Uh, this is, uh, and they're in color. Uh, <laughs> that's why it's so heavy. But both of these are, they're from the uh, Institute of Creation Research. I'll bet you the answer to your question would be in here. Um but we will also discuss that. But actually, the, the most immediate answer is I've never read a discussion about that p- specific thing, how much land, how much uh, water. But I think we, we, well, and we'll get to here in a moment, that there was change. There was the flood itself changed the earth. So, if there was 50%, 50%, that probably changed some, but who knows. Let me read this verse again. Then God said, let the earth... Sw- uh, well, just before that, He says, the, the dry land is revealed. And immediately he says, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit, after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. It was accomplished. He said it and it happened. 
Well, now this means that the dry land did not consist of raw slabs of rock. Steaming rock, I would think. But was complete with soil and nutrients suitable for vegetation. That is, grass, plants, or herbs, already bearing seeds, and fruit trees sufficiently mature to be already bearing mature fruit with seeds, all in the same day. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Bear with me. Yeah. In other words, within the brief span of one day, God revealed dry land and created full flowering gardens, meadows, and orchards. Verse 12 confirms that this occurred immediately. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And we determined, I believe it was last week, good means that's exactly how I wanted it to happen. It happened just the way I wanted it. Verses 26 to 31 of chapter 1 state that within the sixth day of creation, God made both... Well, this would be a good place to... Any, any questions or comments right now about what we've just looked at? Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm I'm laying the groundwork for my argument. There's some points where he says God can produce something that's not brand new. <laughs> There's always somebody. There's always a dentist in the crowd who takes your 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 uh <laughs> steals your thunder. <laughs> You're right, Kimosabi. Verse 20, verses 26 to 31 of chapter 1 state that within the sixth day of creation, God made both man and woman. In one day, He made both man and woman. Now, let's fast forward again to verse 7 in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 7. To the more detailed narrative of the creation of man. Then Yahweh God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so the man became a living being. Now look at verses 15 to 16. Then Yahweh God took the man and set him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may surely eat, and so on. Note that this all occurs prior to the creation of Eve. Yet, according to chapter 1, both man and woman are created on day 6. So all this that we're reading right now in chapter 2 happens in the same day, day 6, before Eve was created. And here we have the evidence that God created man a mature human being. The first man did not begin life as a newborn babe. Born from whom? A baby would not be able to cultivate the garden. I don't think. I don't know a lot about babies, but I don't think they could cultivate a garden. One. Yeah, he could fertilize one. <laughs> Nor could he reach the fruit hanging on the trees for sustenance. Man was, born, man was created a, a, a vegetarian. Likewise, a baby would not be able to name all the cattle and birds of the sky and every beast of the field. I don't think so. Thus, we see a pattern during the creation of the heavens and the earth of God creating things ready to go, as it were. The world, its components of gardens and fields and rivers and mountains, and its inhabitants, man, woman, the beasts of the field, were not created each in its seminal state, but in a mature, developed 
state. A state that any scientist examining a mountain or chasm during these first days would declare old. Yet it has just been created out of nothing by the Word of God. Professor John C. Whitcomb, who, by the way, has spoken at our church, in his classic work, The Genesis Flood, which is along the lines of this book here carved in stone, just has black and white pictures and fewer of them, speaks of the creation effort itself imposing such age upon the earth. So, God creates earth in an advanced state, old. He creates the first man, mature. Then, one of the things John C. Whitcomb points out is that then the creation effort, the energies involved in that, even being created by God, would have aged the earth. He writes, This initial act of creation in Genesis 1-1 quite evidently included the structure and materials of at least the earth's core and some sort of crust and surface materials. The first description given of its appearance is that of water, the deep, covering its surface, and of a dense shroud of darkness, Genesis 1-2, enveloping it. It seems reasonable that even if the earth's creation was accomplished as an instantaneous act, its internal heat and the waters on its face would immediately have begun to perform works of profound geological significance. That's Whitcomb. So what he's saying, I believe, is that God creates the earth. Well, he creates an earth that has a core, that has certain energies built into it. But yet the surface is covered with water. The interaction between those two things is going to age the earth. It's going to, things are going to move. And I didn't read it, but I believe from what I did look at that it, that book speaks of much the same thing. He goes on in his work, Whitcomb, do, Whitcomb does, to make the case that the deluge itself, this is his primary point of his book, the deluge itself, the great flood of chapters 7 and 8, would do even far more to chisel the earth with age. So, that gets back to your question of, you know, how much land, dry land, how much water. It surely changed because of the flood, because of the deluge. We have had, for a very long time, a poster child for the young earth position. Anybody want to? Archbishop Usher. Boy, blank stares. Huh? Well, you're too young. Archbishop Usher, I mean, when I was a kid, every King James Bible had a chart of dates by Archbishop Usher. Are you kidding me? Nobody's, it, no nodding of heads, nothing? Oh, for crying out loud. Nobody's as old as. I gave a copy to my son. I didn't do that. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh, right. Okay, well, then pay attention. The original, yeah. Well, I know, I know the Bible, the first Bible my parents gave me, it still bears the marks of being thrown into my saddle baskets on my bike. Uh, respect for God's Word. You know, come out of Sunday school, throw it on your bike. Uh, uh, and that had this, okay, well, pay attention. You, you look. Okay, all right. The late Archbishop of Armagh, James Usher, he lived from 1581 to 1656, 
basing his conclusion primarily on a literal interpretation of the king lists and genealogies in the Old Testament, he calculated. He calculated to the day, the day the earth was created. It was in October, I believe. That the earth was 4,004, that's 4, 004 years old. Following his method, he would have had to add, he would have to add to, following his method, we would have to add to Usher's total approximately 350 to 400 more years because he died a while ago. He died in 367. But just as the New Testament does not include every word spoken or every act done by Christ Jesus, John 21, 25, the Old Testament can be taken literally while still acknowledging that there are gaps in the king lists and genealogies. For example, a son, S-O-N, does not have to mean a literal next generation as I am the son of my father, Alvin Lewis Lample, but can simply mean a descendant, as it does in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, Jesus was not born to the wife, one of the wives of David, and certainly not born to Abraham. It just means he's in the lineage. He's in the line. The Bible does not list every person descended from Adam and Eve or Noah. Oh, that's yeah, a good time to show this book, too. This is interesting. I wish I'd had the time to... These are very interesting. Another book that Mervyn gave me. Traced. Human DNA's Big Surprise. And it makes the case, I believe that he, this scientist traced human DNA for everyone back to Noah. Right? Yeah. Fascinating. Lots of nice colored pictures in there, too. Oh, I didn't. I, I, think I, I don't think I lost a one of them. Don't worry about it. So, fascinating books. Or was I? The Bible does not list every person descended from Adam and Eve or Noah, nor does it contain the name of every king or queen who ever ruled. So that is an inaccurate measure by which to ascertain the age of the earth. Yet because his estimation was included in most King James Bibles, at least the ones I saw, I must have been out there. It must have been a Marshalltown kind of thing. Uh, many of us grew up taking Usher's figures as gospel truth. They were in the Bible. They were in a concordance in, right right after the maps. I mean, there they were. I, I, remember, I remember the chart. On the face of it, however, 4,000 years would not be sufficient for all the historical civilizations and empires for which we have both documentation and solid archaeological evidence. It's just not enough time in 4,000 years to accomplish it all. Yet, there is a considerable span of possibilities between 4,404 years and 1,840 million years. I conclude that from the evidence of Scripture and from the physical evidence of this earth, that our earth is older than Usher's calculations, but far, far younger than our earth is older, but far, far younger than the calculations of today's scientists. It is indeed an old earth. Yes. But much of that age was built into the earth from the beginning. I mean, if God can make the heavens and the earth, can't he cut a swath in the earth to create a canyon? 
Or can't he, say, point his finger at the earth and it does this? It seems a small thing for somebody who could put all the stars in the universe. With additional layers of age and weathering accomplished by the deluge of Genesis 7 and 8, if, as Whitcomb, and I'm guessing that author uh, states, it was a worldwide flood. It was not localized. It was the entire world. That being the case, that's going to do a lot of changes. That's going to make a lot of changes. And, of course, the earth has aged since then. Most scientists, sorry, Simeon, most scientists, geologists, etc., begin from a position that it is simply nonsensical and impossible to take the Bible literally when it comes to things that should be, by all rights, be relegated exclusively to science. But they forget, or more the case, deny outright that it was Almighty God who created the science they so worship. Science, God's created science, is correct. It is their conclusions that are incorrect. Contrary to the fallen philosophies of this world, we are to begin from a position that nothing is impossible for an omnipotent creator of the universe. If we find some of what he did, some of what he writes, confusing, or even hard to grasp, that reflects a deficiency in our faith, not a deficiency in him. Okay. What are your thoughts? Speak, youth. Oh, oh, the the drift of the uh, okay, okay. Do you believe there are like there's like truth to that? Because my only thought is there were people in the Americas when everybody else was over in like Europe. How did they get to be over there? I recently finished reading a fascinating book. The title of it is 1491, and it makes the case that it shows that, you know, we always thought the sophisticated Europeans came over to the Americas and found heathen savages. Oh, they may have been heathen, but they had societies that were far in advance (laughs) of what the Europeans were doing. And there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them talking about both North and South America, which is really beside the point of your question. I don't, I do not yet see any reason why that could not be the case? Uh, I hesitate to say absolutely uh, because I'm learning this just along with everyone else in the class. Um, but yes, when you look at... And, and I'm wondering if the guy who wrote the DNA book might have something to say about that. If, he, if he's tracing DNA... Uh, it, it does there does seem to be evidence why, how that could have been and 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 of course when you even just looking at the shapes of the continents now you think well it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together they all fit so it does seem to make sense yeah no let's go to mervin could you please speak have i been saying mervin melvin i'm sorry i'm sorry just don't call me late for dinner i won't Promise. Could you restate your question, please? Yeah, like, do you believe that there's any truth to the all confusing land and the earth being one and then splitting apart in the middle of the multiple continents? The second part of your 
question. That, that's true. It, it, it is there. No question about that. Second part of your question I found is the, the people being unable to try to do things in EOC or had the death penalty. They were forced, after the Tower of Babel, they were forced, God said, multiply and fill the earth. The animals did that. Man did not. He <coughs> built the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. This was during the time after the flood, post-flood, the Ice Age period, when a lot of the water became solid. It became, there was a period of intense ice, huge ice period. So, the land, there was more land exposed because of the water was in the form of an ice. Certain parts of the, of the world, so man could walk along a lot of places. <coughs> and he was able to walk from wherever the Tower of Babel was in the Mideast around Okay, Melvin has just removed the last session for this class. He's just covered everything in the last session for this class. <laughs> no, go ahead. Empires. Empires. And, and a lot of legend and probably folklore, but even more than that, a lot of the native, quote, native Indians said, oh, yeah, there were people here before us. And so who those people were, I don't know. But <coughs> it's, it's quite interesting when you start listening to that. Greg. Scientists can tell you where uh, the descendants of Noah's sons are, where they all went to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some went way over here, some went way up there. And, uh, you know, I, I think I mean, they can attribute them all to Noah's sons. There, there aren't additional people somewhere. They, they, they all come out of Noah's mm -hmm. sons. Mm hmm that would include America, that would include, you know, so the people in, in the older civilizations there nonetheless got there from the Middle East after, after the flood. But it, you, you did stop short, though, especially when you get to chapter 2. I thought you were going to get there, but, you know, God's crowning creation was the woman. <laughs> we are. <laughs> oh yeah. You're not suggesting two different men. Oh, no. No. That's man, man and woman. <coughs> place in my memory, this explanation is another place in the Bible where this occurs. Not in regards to, to Genesis, the creation, but another instance where a, a later chapter is an in-depth explanation of a previous chapter. Stay tuned. Stay tuned when we Thank get you. there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One piece at a time. We're only on day two. 
Father, we thank You for Your patience with us as we struggle through. Understand Your Word, and we do want to understand it according to how it was written, not how this world has changed it and forced it to comply with their theories. We call upon Your Spirit to guide us, both in preparation for these sessions and for the discussion of them. In Jesus' name, amen.